The Green Bay Packers can be the best team in the NFC. And no, this is not an April Fool's joke. You are Locked On Packers. Your daily Green Bay Packers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, every day. You are Locked On Packers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm Peter Bukowski, and I cover the Packers for The Leap, a newsletter I would love for you to subscribe to. Follow me on Twitter, Peter underscore Bukowski. Follow the podcast on Twitter, Locked On Packers. Like us on Facebook, subscribe to the podcast, iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, wherever you find podcasts, you will find Locked On Packers, the number one Packers podcast on the internet. And the show for fans who know what happened, they want to know why and how. Thanks to everyone who makes Locked on Packers their first listen every day. We hope you like starting your day with us as much as we like starting our day with you. Today's episode brought to you by our friends at FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's 200 bucks. If your bet wins, visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. The Green Bay Packers can be the best team in the NFC in 2024. And that's not strong enough, actually. You can make a plausible case the Packers should be the favorites in the NFC. Let's just look at how it went down last year. The Packers go to Dallas and absolutely blow the doors off the Cowboys in a way that did not then and does not now seem at all fluky. It was an ass-kicking on both sides of the ball. Then they go to San Francisco and they went toe-to-toe with the best team in the NFC. Unequivocally, All season, the best team in the NFC was the San Francisco 49ers. There was that little stretch early in the season, a couple rainy games, Debo Samuel doesn't play, and Brock Purdy didn't look great. Trent Williams had some injuries. But for most of the year, they just blew everybody out. And the Packers dropped two interceptions. They got a terrible spot on a fourth down call. They got called for a ridiculous penalty, driving the score. A lot of things had to go against them. As the youngest team in the league, one of the youngest offenses we've ever seen, first playoff run for almost everybody on the team. And they they hang right with the best team in the division. Okay, other playoff teams in the NFC last year. The Eagles... A complete and total mess by the end of the year. Nick Sirianni. I don't want to say he's a fraud because I think he is what we all thought he was when he was hired. I think the run to the Super Bowl last year was fraudulent. That was nonsense. In a week, in a week conference, and you got to play a team with no quarterback. Not just with, with Brock Purdy. Brock Purdy gets hurt. And you get to play backups. Fifth string, sixth string. If you go back to like week one starter stuff. How the how are the Eagles better? They traded Hassan Reddick. No, no, they, they signed Aubrey Huff. They get Saquon Barkley. But like, cool, you got a running back. The problems that they had last year are still the problems that they, they have now. They upgraded a defensive coordinator. But the secondary issues remain. They have major questions offensively on the future of an offense without Jason Kelsey. How good is Jalen Hurts? We don't know. I think they're closer to the team we saw at the end of the year than the team that we saw rip through the NFC two seasons ago. Okay. None of those other NFC East teams are any good. The NFC North... The Vikings are worse. You lose Sam Darnold, or you (laughs) lose Sam Darnold. You lose Kirk Cousins, and you replace him with Sam Darnold. Even if you get a healthy Justin Jefferson, they're going to trade up, it seems, for what is likely J.J. McCarthy. 
They're worse, and the Packers beat the crap out of them the last time that those two teams played. The Buccaneers, yeah, they beat the Packers last year. That was a Joe Barry special. They didn't they didn't look that good against anybody else. Joe Barry's not walking through that door. They replaced Joe Barry. Now, we don't know if Jeff Halfley is going to be better, but it wouldn't be that hard to be much better. And I look at that Bucks team. There's a lot of turnover on that team. Uh, still a lot of questions, a lot of holes, player for player. I don't think they're as good as Green Bay. Okay. Packers beat the Rams last year. I know no Matt Stafford, but I look at that roster up and down. Aaron Donald retires. Who are the game breakers? It's Matt Stafford. It's Cooper Cup, who's now getting up in age, dealing with injuries. Matt Stafford's always dealing with injuries. Did it again last year. Puka Nakua, we'll see if he can keep on keeping on. The defense. You lose a really good defensive coordinator. Are they going to be even just as good as they were last year? That brings us back to the 49ers. Eric Armstead out. Brandon Ayuk doesn't seem super happy about what's going on there. Is his contract going to be to his liking? Are they going to trade Debo Samuel? Are they going to trade Ayuk? Is Christian McCaffrey going to stay healthy for a season? How many years can you get that close before the odds just say, look, you've got to have one of those seasons where everything goes wrong? And Kyle Shanahan... One injury, two injuries. They've had those kinds of years in San Francisco in the past. Debo Samuel has an injury history. Trent Williams, by far their best offensive lineman. They decide Cole McKivitz because they don't have anybody else. I I have to believe they're going to be worse. Because I don't see where the improvement is coming. Certainly not personnel. The personnel isn't better. And then who are the players that are going to get significantly better? Brock Purdy? Are you are you serious? He's already maxed out. Is George Kittle going to stay healthy again? Dre Greenlaw's probably out for the first at least half of the year with Achilles and then is not going to be the same guy in all likelihood as he was before. But then you look at the Packers and you go, okay, They add Xavier McKinney, a true difference maker in the back end. That is a clear upgrade over Darnell Savage. Whatever they do at the other safety spot, probably not going to be that much different because they did not have a quality player for most of the year in that spot all season. So they're not going to get worse. Linebacker, okay. But like Devondre Campbell's not a needle mover. If you get a little bit of improvement from Carl Brooks, a little bit of improvement from Kobe Wooden, from Devontae Wyatt, from Lucas Van Ness, from Rashawn Gary, From Carrington Valentine, you get a healthy Jair Alexander. You get a healthy Eric Stokes. Those guys come back. You go to the offensive side. It's status quo, basically. You swap Darren Jones for Josh Jacobs. It's a a like player for like player. Culturally. Like player for like player from a quality perspective. You keep A.J. Dillon. Are you going to get a little bit of improvement from Jordan Love? Are you going to get a lot? Even just a little would be nice. We know development isn't always linear, but a little. You're going to get a healthy Christian Watson. They were the best offense in the league or one of the best offenses in the league second half of the season without Christian Watson. With a rookie Luke Musgrave and Tucker Craft and and Jaden Reed and Dontavian Wicks, who was also banged up. And it was Rasheed Walker, first-time starter. And Zach Tom, First time, full time starter at right tackle. This team can get so much better just because they're together again. Who are the teams that scare you in the NFC? Okay, the Lions in their own division. They handled the Lions last time they saw that team in their building on a short week. Again, player for player, talent for talent. I think Detroit is worse than they were last year. Now, they made some nice signings. I I like some of the things that they did. But I think...
benefit of in the second half, that defense was ugh. in the first half, they were getting turnovers. Second half, couldn't rush the passer. Now they had Carlton Davis. They had DJ Reader. They had Marcus Davenport. But that secondary is still sketchy. Sketchy. Do they have secondary playmakers on offense? How much are they going to rely on that offensive line? To me, there are three teams that matter in the NFC when it, were, when it comes to the Packers and the hierarchy. It's the Lions, who they beat last year, the last time they saw them. And it's the 49ers, the team that they should have beat. I just They're better than the Eagles to me right now. They're better than the Cowboys to me right now. They're better than the Bucks right now. The Falcons, any team in the NFC South, any team in the NFC North that's not the Lions, any team in the NFC East, they're better than those teams. And their ceiling is as high as any team in, in the league. They can be not just the best team in the NFC North. They can be the best team in the NFL. They can. Doesn't mean they will be, but they can. And they did it without an owner. I want to talk about that in just a second here on Locked on Packers. Today's episode brought to you by our friends at FanDuel. The sports calendar loaded right now, and FanDuel is making it even more exciting to get in on the action. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. You've got the men's college basketball tournament, the women's college basketball tournament. Baseball is back. I just dropped a couple futures on some baseballs. I like the Phillies. Division odds and World Series odds. Big fan of those. But on the Diamondbacks, like 35 to 1. They were just in the World Series. And the NFL futures dropped. I bet on the Packers over 9.5. Over 9.5 at FanDuel. Now there's, there's juice on that. But nine and a half, they just went nine and eight. I just told you they'd be the best team in the league. Go get on that. 200 bucks to bet on Major League Baseball, the NBA. I didn't even mention, I didn't even mention the NBA. And so much more. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet a big win. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Are you watching Fox Sports or ESPN on your TV all day? Have you had to turn down the volume because of all the screaming? Make the switch to Locked On Sports today, a free 24-7 sports streaming channel programmed for you every day to bring you the biggest stories without all the screaming. Locked On Sports today brings you the can't-miss analysis, opinions, and news streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. If you haven't been following... What's going on around the league? Uh, the Bills and their fans are pretty mad right now because almost a billion dollars in public money went to the Bills for the stadium. Public money, not a stock sale, public money. Taxpayer dollars. And they're jacking up prices, seat licenses, those kinds of things. Socialized cost, privatized profit. And you look around the league. And I don't know how any reasonable person can go, it would be better for the Packers to have had an owner. And I've been thinking about this a lot lately. Not just, you know, the stock sale. It seems obvious to me why you do that. Why you say, hey, um, anyone who wants to give us money as an organization for capital improvements, please do that. We'll take your money if you want to give it to us. And then you can feel connected to your team. It's actually a pretty remarkable thing that the Packers do. Now, over the years, have they had to go to the public? Have they attempted via referendums to raise public funds? Sure, they have. But it's also the case that they have raised millions and millions and millions of dollars from people who are willing to say, 
for a stock certificate that they can hang on their wall to say, I am an owner of the Packers that gets them absolutely no rights or dividends or anything to say, I'm contributing to my team that I love. And the benefit is for everyone, is for your community, that people who don't want to have to pay don't have to. They don't have to. Now, this has also come up because Mark Murphy said that they have cut off negotiations with the city of Green Bay on the lease negotiations of Lambeau Field. Um, There's some contentiousness there. They still have 18 years left on the lease or whatever it is, and the Packers are not going to move forward with some of the renovations that they had planned for the NFL draft. It seems like a negotiating technique. I don't like that part of it. That part of it is separate. Um, But it is a good example. That, what Mark Murphy is doing, is what an owner would do. They would rattle their saber and they would say, hey, if you guys don't give us the money that we want or give us the terms that we want, we're not going to we're not going to add value to the thing that is already driving so much value for you in the city of Green Bay. And that is if the Packers really wanted to just stick it to the city and say, look, the city of Green Bay would no longer exist if not for the Packers, which like not literally, but it would it would basically be. I don't know. I don't I don't want to throw shade on any. I was going to try and pick like. Uh, a city in Michigan or Minnesota just to really drive the point home. I'm not going to do that. But the point is, it would it would not be what it is. And it is, a, it is a wonderful city. I have family in Green Bay. I love Green Bay. It would not be even as big as it is, even as vibrant as it is, if not for the Green Bay Packers. It wouldn't. It just wouldn't. The Packers could be more annoying about it if they wanted to be. But when you look at what Jerry Jones is doing in Dallas and the meddling and the Pagulas in Buffalo, we're talking about one of the like 215, 250, something like that, richest people in the world. And they're asking for public money for a stadium because they can. And you look at the moves that have been made. Sean Payton in Denver. For what? The impatience. Teams can't do what the Packers did with Aaron Rodgers if they have an owner. An owner never signs off on that. The Packers, if they had an owner, could never have done what they did with Jordan Love and take Jordan Love if they had an owner. These teams, these ownership groups, they expect results. And so they are looking at it in a more short-sighted way because egos get involved. The Packers have always been able to take the long view. And I know that that is is where some of the criticism comes in, where fans are going to go, but the long view is the reason that you don't have any Super Bowls since 2010 and only one since 96 because there is not a sense of urgency. And to that I say, that's not true because... Very few other teams, like if you take the Patriots out of it, no one has been closer or been to the Super Bowl more often than the Packers in the Ted Thompson, Brian Gutekinds, Ron Wolf era. This structure works when you have good GMs, which that's what the Packers have had, luckily. But being able to operate in the now while also constantly thinking about how to set up the team for the future is how you constantly are around the rim. You're constantly giving yourself opportunities. And the Packers, I mean, I understand they they did not go to as many Super Bowls as you would think they would have in the Aaron Rodgers era. They didn't win as many with Brett Favre and Aaron Rodgers as you would think they would have. But how many times... Did they get close where they just needed the ball to bounce a little bit differently? Where they needed the ball to literally bounce to Brandon Bostic? Or they needed, uh, you know, one one play in the Arizona game 
to go differently in in pick a year, by the way, Arizona, the 2009 season or the 2015 season, or they just needed to not be as hurt in 2021 or 2020. You needed David Bakhtiari in one of those games. Or you needed the the punt to just not be blocked. You needed Aaron Jones to just keep running. Like they are, they are five plays in five different games away from having three or four Super Bowls more than they already have. And one of the major reasons is their ability to operate without the burden. And that's what it is to me. The burden of an owner who in almost every case in professional sports is a malevolent force in the organization. How many good owners are there in professional sports? Not even just the NFL, in pro sports. There's like four. Most owners. And all and, and you know what? Part of this is that the bad owners we know. But do you know why? Because they're really bad. Would you rather have no owner or Dan Snyder? No owner or Robert Sarver? No owner or the McCaskey family? These these are not hard questions. And so the reason that the Packers, one of the reasons anyway, that they have been so successful for so long, the reason that they could make the Jordan Love move or the Aaron Rodgers move, the reason that they were happy to say, we'll trade Aaron Rodgers and we'll, we'll roll with Jordan Love because an owner might throw his body in front of that. And an owner might have been manipulated by Aaron Rodgers to the point that they would have traded Jordan Love by now. So maybe you maybe you can convince your owner to trade to, to take Jordan Love, for example. And then Aaron Rodgers throws a hissy fit about it. Well, Rodgers could have win, won that argument. You look at the Patriots. There were times when Bill Belichick was ready to tell Tom Brady no, and Bob Kraft, who is considered a good owner, and I think he is probably a good owner, was like, actually, and he played peacemaker, but there were times when he sided with Brady, time with, times when he sided with Belichick. How many times can those things go wrong? And ultimately, it went wrong enough that Tom Brady had to leave. He left and won another Super Bowl somewhere else. Said, deuces, I'm out. The Patriots should treat their stars better. Are there... Are there small reasons you might want to say, okay, they could have been more aggressive here. I would like them to say, I'm not I'm not as worried about a third round pick versus a fourth round pick. Yes, there are times when that is true. But organizationally, the approach in the aggregate is a good one. And it is it is precisely because they're always going, you know what? We think the value of it is this. And it's like, okay, it's fine to pay $5 more for a bottle of wine or $2 more for milk one time. But if you do that, you go to the grocery store one day, say, oh, that milk's $3 more expensive. And two days later, you got to go get more milk. Uh, okay, $3 more expensive. All of a sudden, over the course of the year, you've convinced yourself, well, every in every single time, it was rational to say, well, I can pay two extra dollars. But then over the course of the year, now you've spent how many hundreds of extra dollars? That's how that's how this team building thing works. If you're willing to overpay here, now you're willing may probably willing to overpay there and well, in a vacuum, I can I can justify paying this guy a couple extra dollars. Do you see how this spirals? Do you see how this snowballs? By having a an organizational philosophy where you're going, the value is the value, that's what we believe. And in most cases, we're going to stick to that. And only in outlier cases are we going to make exceptions. And we're going to operate without the pressure and burden of an owner who's going, hey, 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 I'll pay it. It's fine. I'll pay it. Just do it. That's why they've been one of the best organizations in the NFL, in sports, in pro sports, over the last 30 plus years. All right. Mock Draft Monday. We'll do it in just a second on Locked on Packers. Today's episode brought to you by our friends at BetterHelp. We all want to be the best versions of ourselves, and that means finding time to do the things 
we want to be able to do. And the question is, if you had time, unlimited time, how would you use it? The best way to squeeze that special thing into your schedule is to know what's important to you and make it a priority. Therapy can help you find what matters to you so you can do more of it. Sometimes it really is that easy. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire and get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Learn to make time for what makes you happy with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash locked on to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash locked on. And thanks to everyone who makes Locked On Packers their first listen every day. Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. And now it's also available on Amazon Fire on the free Fire TV channels app. Locked On Sports Today here for you 24-7 covering the top sports stories of the day. With the local experts of Locked On plus our national shows covering every league. Find Locked On Sports Today now available on the free Fire TV channels app. So I used a new... Mock Draft Simulator, not it's not new to the world, but it is new this season. The Pro Football Network Simulator. And the reason I wanted to do something different is I, you know, I didn't want to get locked into always using the Pro Football Focus Simulator because you you kind of you, you get a little um you end up with the same with the same player choices a lot. And I just didn't want to do that. So this was interesting because the Pro Football Network has free trades. I got a trade offer and I thought, okay, the top corners are gone. Tyler Guyton was there, but let's say he wasn't. What would a trade down look like? And I got this offer from Houston. It's 42 and 59 plus a future third round pick. So for 25, I'm getting three Day three picks, including two seconds. I thought, okay, now I have 41 and 42. And I really like the depth of the draft in that range. So I took this. And now you're sitting there at 41. And unfortunately, those those top offensive line, they're off the board. I I didn't like it. I didn't like being here, which, which is the interesting part of um, the experiment is I I didn't find that my options were as good as I thought they would be or, or certainly as good as I wanted them to be. So I took Edrin Cooper, the linebacker from Texas A&M at 41. It would be a reach for me personally, but I think he's a second round player. Given how badly they need a linebacker, like th- this falls under the take the player who maximally improves, improves your roster stra- idea. I think you can make the case that a good linebacker improves their roster more than a good player at almost any other position. Because you might still get a good player out of Eric Stokes. You might still get a good player out of Carrington Valentine. Their offensive line, Sean Ryan might still be a good player. This is the only spot where you're like, do they have any? Do they have one guy who could be a good player? I don't know. So I I did that. And then at 42... I got a little crazy because I I didn't love where the board was. And I took Adisa Isaac, the pass rusher from Penn State. I think one of the reasons why I did did that here too, good athlete, um, program pedigree in the Big Ten at Penn State. And I think the Packers, you you can never have too much pass rush. You can never have too much edge rush. And he is a different kind of player than they have. He's not small, really about 250, but he's got a little bit more twitch, a little bit more of a speed rusher than than the players that they currently have. And again, this is a luxury pick, so let's make a luxury pick. At 58, speaking of luxury picks, Jonathan Brooks, the running back from Texas, trading for, or tra- signing Josh Jacobs and then re-signing A.J. Dillon gives you runway at the running back spot. You don't need a third running back to come in and play for you right away. But Jonathan Brooks is the kind of guy who in a year, when A.J. Dillon's probably not on this team, he can be running back two when he's fully recovered from that ACL. And then in year three, he's your lead back. 
that's a, that can be a really valuable player at 58. Maybe you're going, okay, for a running back three, like, is that the best use of your resources for a guy like Brooks who, you know, I, I've heard from NFL scouts that he could have been a first round pick if he'd have stayed healthy. Like that's how good he was. That's real. That's a real player. So to get him at 58 end of the second round, I still have 59 because that was part of my trade. So I, I add Roger Rosengarten, the offensive tackle from Washington. Terrific athlete. He's getting like, could be a late first round kind of guy buzz. The the tools, the athleticism, I think that is going to intrigue the Packers. P- big time playing time at a big time program right now. I can see the Packers going, hey, maybe this can be something. Take that shot on the high upside on the athletic on the athletic traits. And then you get 88 and 91. So you have four second round picks. No first round picks. Four second round picks. At 88, I took Cole Bishop, the safety from Utah. Again, elite athleticism. I don't think he is a deep safety, but I think he can he can play deep in a pinch, especially deep half, not deep middle. I like him near the line of scrimmage. Well, Xavier McKinney, he can play the post. We talked about this on Friday with Sam Munson. Like, McKinney just opens up so much for you. And I wasn't going to do it. But because he was still there, and I thought it was interesting, Javon Bullard at 91, I just thought, okay, you could take a safety and then take someone like Bullard and he can play your he can play nickel or he can play safety or he can play all over the place and having that versatility you just need more bodies in that room and so even if you flip that even if you took Bullard at 59 whatever it is i like the idea of taking two safeties on day 2 whether it's one in one in round 2 one in round 3 two in round 3 two in round 2 i'd be into it i just thought that th- those were these these are all names that i think are going to be in play at all those spots and so to have two extra picks, I thought was an interesting thought exercise at the very least. So um, I didn't, I didn't ultimately love my options at the top, but I come out of this going, I actually really like the class as a whole because you're you're adding at least two potential starters at safety and linebacker, two of your big problems problem areas, a developmental tackle with elite athleticism, a developmental pass rusher with terrific athleticism, and then. The guy that everyone agrees, if he were healthy, would be the best running back in this class and a potential star uh, in, in Jonathan Brooks. So I'm I'm happy with it. No corner, I understand. But they seem to like the guys that they have. Remember I told you don't believe Brian Goodikins, but it could play out this way. So we had a little fun. Back tomorrow, much more here as we get. It's, it's April. It's April. So it's draft season. It's draft month, three weeks and change away. So we're going to be ramping up, really, really getting in gear here, talking a lot of drafts over the next couple of weeks. Follow me on Twitter, Peter underscore Bukowski. Follow the podcast on Twitter, Locked on Packers, Instagram, Locked on Packers, TikTok, Locked on Packers, Facebook, Locked on Packers, YouTube, Locked on Packers. Subscribe anywhere you get podcasts, Locked on Packers, so you can stay Locked on Packers.